are higher taxes on properties, luxury cars and cigarettes. Excise duties for tobacco go up by 15 percent today. Or the buyer's stamp duty for higher value residential and non-residential properties will increase from tomorrow. Michelle Teo tells us more. The increased marginal buyer's stamp duty will affect residential properties that exceed $1.5 million in value. These make up about 15% of the market. For non-residential ones, it'll affect properties valued at more than $500,000 or about 60% of the market. Buyers of luxury cars with an open market value of above $80,000 will also have to pay 320% the additional registration fee from the next COE bidding round. These, along with new taxes on tobacco products, are expected to generate some $800 million in revenue. Even as these contribute to Singapore's coffers, changing global stances on taxation threaten our takings. For instance, the take-up of the base erosion and profit-shifting initiatives, which are aimed at combating tax evasion by multinational firms. Under the first of two main pillars, large multinational firms have to reallocate profits to where the customers are, not just where business is conducted. For Singapore, this would mean losing tax revenue. The second pillar introduces a minimum effective corporate tax rate of 15% on large multinational firms. If a company's effective tax rate in Singapore is, for example, 13%, other jurisdictions can collect the 2% difference. We will have less scope to use tax incentives to attract new investments. Meanwhile, the US and other countries are rolling out vast subsidies to build up their strategic industries. It will not be possible for us to outbid these countries with even bigger subsidies just to get their MNEs to invest here. But neither can we afford to be complacent and simply take our competitive position for granted. Despite the impact on the nation's competitiveness, Mr Wong says Singapore will play its part by implementing Pillar 2 from 2025 onwards. At the same time, a domestic top-up tax will be introduced to ensure that effective corporate tax rates for large multinationals hit 15%. One analyst says this means Singapore will have to focus more on non-tax incentives to continue attracting investments. A tax incentive is likely going to be the icing, if not the cherry. Uh, on the cake, but there are other factors, for example, you know, your access to uh, where your customers are, your proximity to your uh, suppliers, your connectivity with the rest of the world. And I guess one of the challenges that Singapore will have is to ensure that we continue to have all of this. Overall deficit for this budget is expected to hit 0.1% of GDP, and no draw on reserves is expected. In May 2020, the government raised the contingencies fund's balance from $3 billion to $16 billion to ensure we could respond quickly to urgent and unforeseen cash flow needs arising from the fast-evolving pandemic. With the return to normalcy, I will reduce the balance of the contingencies fund from $16 billion to $6 billion. This will ensure adequate resources for unforeseen circumstances while retaining discipline in how we manage our finances. We've been going over the key announcements of Singapore's budget 2023. And during his speech, Mr Wong warned that the road ahead will not be easy. But he says Singapore has never shied away from adversity. As the country weathers cost of living pressures and an uncertain global environment, he says the real strength of Singapore lies in its people, like those who worked on the front lines battling COVID-19, who still found time to volunteer. Sir, this is what the Singapore spirit is about. And we have seen this in action and experienced it in abundance over the last three years how we are responsible for one another, keep an eye out for our fellow citizens and always band together as a team. And as one united people, we can move forward with confidence in this new era and shape a brighter future and a better Singapore together. Mr Speaker, I beg to move.